Hello, party people. It is three in the morning here in sunny Chicago, Illinois. I am spinning some bells and I had a thought. Here's some bells in process that you saw last video. French horn bells I gotta do for like six months. Here's some 25 bells. There, it's hard to see from this perspective, but there's 25 bells on those two carts there. And then I got some interesting bells, trombone bell. You saw that. Bells on the spinner right now. These two just came off the mandrel. This one's yet to go on. This one's yet to go on. These are 229 bells. So it's a box. C trumpet. It's the most popular box C trumpet bell. Has been since forever, I'm pretty sure. I would be surprised to hear that a 238 was more popular or 239. If I can find my tripod here, here's the thing. I would argue, and I like to argue, that this is the hardest trumpet bell to spin. It's hardest to spin well, hardest to spin consistently. And there's some pretty interesting explanations as to why. I would also argue that of all the Bach bells, this is the hardest to copy because of it being hard to spin. If I can find my tripod, I'm always looking for this thing. Ah, oh, there it is. A Bach 229, and this is very cool because I made this mandrel a few months ago and I based it off of a bunch of 229s and kind of the ones that I thought had, I, I don't know. I have a really odd approach to design because I'm not a trumpet player. I like to listen to trumpets. I enjoy studying trumpets that have been designed in the past, but my core, I'm a French horn player, whatever. I like French horn shit. But trumpets are easy to make and easy to make a trumpet mandrel. So I have lots of trumpet mandrels. But a 229 is a really important bell. It's kind of your bread and butter for C trumpet. For me, it should be my bread and butter. I, this is my first batch I've done in this, but it should be a pretty good seller. I already have these orders, so that's good news. What makes the 229 special is it's very Bessany. It's kind of like my Miha, but like on crack. The thing that makes Besson bells special is they have faceting. When you look at like a Bach 37 bell, it's just a straight arc. There's no embellishments in that arc. It's just, you know, like a shogi. It's just pretty arc, nothing fancy, you know, pretty simple arc geometry. But when it comes to a Besson or some Bach bells, some Benj bells, they have facets, which are, you can visually see a different arc intercepting a different arc. So there's two arcs that come together to a point and that point's blended out by sanding and skiving, but it's still there in the arc value. So designing these in CAD is very difficult. So can we get a stool? Because this actually is a lot more in depth than I thought it was. I look like a mess right now because it's 82 degrees and I've been working for 14 hours, but this is when I get all talkative. It's very fun. Let's start at the beginning. So imagine you're Vincent Bach and you're sitting at your drafting table and you're on bell number 29 for C trumpets. So if you don't know, the way Bach did trumpet bells is 3743, two, two digits is a B flat bell. 37, 43, 72 are the popular ones. There's a 65, which is kind of a rotary as well, but B flat rotary. 25 is probably the most underrated popular one. People don't really realize that it's out there, but they're everywhere. There's a 38 bell, allegedly on some cornets slash trumpets. I don't know, really not popular, but he did go sequentially. So he started copying the number one bell, which is another bell that Bach offers, which is just a French Besson copy. It's a brevet copy. It's a very, I think it's an early pre-war brevet. It doesn't have nearly the same faceting as the later ones and that's an interesting thought because I do believe that the faceting was not intentional. I, I think it was a result of one of two things or both, which is bad tool making, bad in parentheses. Early, you know, it's early days of tool making and machining. Not like super early, but like, I mean, we're, we gotta remember we are 200 years evolved from their technology and we still use a lot of stuff in their technology, but we have the hindsight when we go to do something. So the traditional way to make a mandrel before CNC kind of destroyed everything as far as tool making, you would cut steps just like people do on lead pipes, just like I used to do on lead pipes. You cut steps into a piece of steel and your steps go to the depth of a point along an arc. So you map out your points every eighth or quarter or half, whatever inch either side. I do quarter because it makes the most sense to me. And then you machine steps to that arc, to that depth along your arc, all the way down the mandrel. Typically mandrels are made in two pieces. I make my flares out of six inches steel, usually two tool steel because that's important. We'll get to that. And then the tail end up ends up being like inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth steel, just saves you a lot of time. And you can actually make the tails more accurately this way because you chuck up on just an inch or so, two inches at a time, and then you move the material out of the spindle so you're always having a rigid cut. You're never cutting 24 inches out. I believe that on those early Besson instruments, they made mandrels that way. I don't believe tracing attachments were popular yet. I do not believe they had access to a tracing attachment at the very least. Because when you look at Besson instruments, they are not straight tapers and they're not straight between the points. They very much bear signs of being filed and sanded 
to blend those steps together. I do a process called skiving, which I'm sure they did in the past as well, which is just basically, I take a sharp piece of carbide, like an insert, graze it to a piece of steel, and I basically wood turn, but with steel and carbide instead of wood and high speed steel. And I'm sure that they did a similar process, if not the same thing. It's just a logical way to remove material and have a fine control of that arc because your eye is a very sensitive thing, especially when something's spinning. You can see discrepancies very clearly, and your arm, if you're a metal spinner and have spun, your relationship between your shoulder and your eye becomes very clear, and you can make very accurate cuts in skiving, as long as your tool is sharp and your material is not vibrating. So I don't think those facets were intentional. I think they were, I've had it happen where it kind of works out whenever it does, ironically. You cut your steps, and one step might get cut a little too deep, and you're not gonna throw out a six inch piece of steel because it's expensive or you put a lot of time into it or you just don't even notice it until you get to the end when you're polishing. One goes too deep or you did not file enough around the hills next to it, but it happens. I think that's what happened on the old Bassett stuff. But the other thing is the mandrels that I make out of today are made from tool steel. Typically D2 tool steel because it's the most wear resistant even in the annealed state. But the mandrels back then, it's kind of hard to say what they were because tool steel wasn't a standardized thing yet. Even when Bach was making mandrels, Tool steel wasn't standard. They called it tool steel, but the closest relationship I have found is to like a 4140, 4340, like alloy steel, and they were cast. I have molds for wood molds for them. They were cast blanks of tool steel, like a alloy steel, a high carbon steel, and then they were machined out of those castings, which is amazing. So insane to think about today, a foundry taking time to cast bell mandrels for a musical instrument company. It's just amazing. So I believe the mandrels were machined incorrectly, resulting in facets. And secondly, I think the steel that they were made from did not lend itself to being wear resistance enough for the quantity of instruments they were making. So I think over time, as the spinners were spinning those bells, what happens in a facet which is, comes full circle, is your tool can kind of hang up. It can like get stuck in that notch. It's a very subtle notch, but it, your, your arms used to do in arcs, right? It can move, it's like a ball joint. It moves it very freely in arcs, but if you have to move in, a, in three axes instead of two, it, it becomes difficult for your arm to process that. So you can actually, if you're not careful, get hung up in those facets and you put a lot of force in them and over time it'll wear that facet even more so it'll become even more dish. And I think that's what happens. So when you look at later pre-war Bessons, they have more not intentional defined facets. I don't, you know, say what you want about how an individual horn plays, but I, I, try, I tend to like the sound of a later Besson, pre-war Besson rather than the earlier ones. Who knows, there's so many variables, so like don't take that as gospel or like don't don't act like I'm saying this like it's my hard opinion, it's just kind of what I've noticed as a trend. You know, there's so many variables like valve fit and material and lead pipe, you know, venturi and shelf and all of this stuff, gap setup. So like, and all the Bessons are wildly different, so it could all be a part, but I, I, as far as the sound, I really do feel like the facets are a pretty big part of that. But a 229 has those facets, like a, like on a Besson and Miha or Besson Brevet, but they're very defined. It's like, the tail is very normal. It's, it's very similar to a 37. It's a little bit faster than a 37. Over here, it gets a little bit more cylindrical here. It's not cylindrical, but it's, you know, trending to the higher point of decimal throughout that area. And once you get to about here, you get your first true arc because it's straight taper back here. It goes from being a taper to being an arc right around here. And you get kind of your first inward dish and it, it's subtle it's thousands of an inch but it's accentuated by the fact that it's about an inch and a half long that dish but then right after you get an outwards dish which is our first facet so between those two is our first facet it's a very 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 small one you can't really see it on a finished bell you can see the two definite changes in arcs, but you can't see the facet because the spring back of the, the brass and all that. But it's there, and it's really important that when you make your mandrel, you account for that. You, after you get that outward arc, you get this spot right here. If you cut the bell right here, it's just a flare. Straight arc flare. It's not an arc, but it's a spline, but it's a pretty gentle flare, nothing out of the normal. And if you cut it, here, you would see the same thing. When you put them together, there's two very distinct arc values. One is an outwards arc, and one is an inwards arc, and they come together at a sharp point on a 229. And I think when Bach did this, it was intentional. The really interesting thing about bell design is 
And Bach put this in his writing. He made a lot of notes. From what I've seen, I haven't had access to the Bach prints, but I, I've heard some things and I've seen pictures. And it, it, they're really kind of not reliable sources. I've seen pictures of Bach measurements that are numbers every half of an inch. And uh, at, like at the bottom, there's a little note that says, make the flare smaller to account for spring back. And it's like, okay, well, thanks, Vince. That's a lot of help. No, no like exponent to make it smaller by or anything like that. If you're smart, you can make some educated guesses. When I started making instruments, well, when I started wanting to make instruments, really, I was really afraid to make a misstep. And I quickly learned, well, I didn't quickly, it took a couple of years to realize no one knows what the hell they're doing. Doing. Even the engineers who will tell you to face that they're geniuses and they know exactly how everything works, they're really just watching anime in their, in their apartment during work. You can't gain the intuition to make the decisions like how much spring back to grant on this bell manual for the bell to be the proper shape because it makes such a huge difference if it's bigger or smaller in the flare or if the facets are in the right spot. You can't tell that by staring at a computer. You can only tell that by spinning a bell and feeling the spring back occur because you can see it and feel it happen. And it's inevitable. You cannot spin a bell without spring back. You could draw a bell without spring back, but you can't spin a bell without spring back. And here's why. When you draw a bell, you cut the bell shorter than the mandrel. I cut mine shorter by about an eighth of an inch, so it's really not that much shorter. And I can do that because my preform, my pre-spin, is very accurate. And it gets the bell tight enough so that it's hard to get the bell off the mandrel after the pre-spin. So I just basically cut off the nose, re-nose it, anneal it, and draw it. Typically, I will draw all the way up to the flare section here. But on the 229, you can see I don't draw all the way up there because I can't because the 229 bell through this area is so much larger and longer than a, a standard bell. It tapers so much slower that my draw bench cart is not long enough and my plastic that I draw with starts to fracture right there. It's actually kind of a good thing because I used to make larger blanks for faceted bells, larger plastics, and I drew it without the cart and I would draw all the way up and I would have it so many issues spinning these out because for some reason you need to spin the facets flush you can't draw over the facet and then go and spin it'll spring back a lot so typically the way i spin bells is really different than the way other people spin bells it and when i spin a bell i only spin towards the belt like for example i spin towards the bell rim i never spin backwards a good amount of bell makers i've seen around the world and very close to me in chicago do a lot of back spinning back spinning results in a wildly inconsistent Bell. What backspinning is, is you'll spin, final pass spin this direction, and then you'll go back over, while the bell is still bolted, mind you, you'll go back over this area backwards and lightly spin it back to make sure it's tight to the mandrel. But when you think about it, when you spin this way, as long as you have room between the actual flare, like up here, and the mandrel, you're creating a bubble. You see this? On this blank, you see this bubble right here from where the draw left off? I cut my 229 bells a little bit shorter just so there's more bubble because on a 229, it flares so sharp at the edge that if you make this tight after the draw, you'll never get it spun, you'll never get it spun out, your facets will pop. And that's what a major manufacturer in the Midwest has happened to every single 229 bell they've ever made. If you leave the bubble and you spin this way, and there's space for the material to not touch the mandrel up here until you want it to, then any excess volume is getting pushed away and out into the air, right? Think of it like that. But if your bell is tight and you have a bolt on it back here and you spin this way, all you're doing is taking that volume that could go out and up until the diameter and you're taking that volume and you're putting it back into this throat area and it's increasing in volume because there's nowhere for it to go so it, it'll bubble out. And then you end up with a grossly oversized bell here and it could be like 30, 40 thousandths oversized in diameter or more. I mean, I've seen crazy stuff. And that's why C bells will play so much more inconsistent than B flats. And that's why players have such a hard time finding a good C trumpet is because the bells are so inconsistent or the horn and C trumpets are so much more sensitive than a B flat. What I do when I'm spinning a 229 is I leave extra material in the bubble. I do my first pass really quickly, really fast, barely touching it with wood, and I spin from the bubble to about here on the flare, right where the second facet is. And then I re soak it and make sure my bolt is tight because I don't like any pushback on the nose. Sometimes you'll see a lot of lumps built up on the nose from the bell pushing back, increasing in length so that the taper is getting further and further apart, which is no good because then you're not making consistent. Bell. I put my bolt tight, do my first pass with wood, halfway, switch to my metal tool, and my metal tool I do on the, use on the 229 is different than my metal tool that I use normally. Normally, I use 
I dropped it. Normally I use this, which I call the Instrument Maker Standard Spinning Tool. This is the same thing I've seen at factories all over the world. Big wood handle, this thing. Big, broad, half round kind of shape. This actually spun Harman mutes back in the day, kind of fun. For 229, they use a really small tool. This is actually the Delta Rockwell Wood Lathe Metal Spinning Kit Tool. It's very small, very tiny, so that your surface area is very small in terms of the contact between your tool and the belt and that helps you avoid bulging off the facet. You make one sweeping motion, 1,000 RPM, and you go at a reasonable pace, but you go even and you don't get held up in the facets. You actually move faster over the facets because the radius of your tool is gonna match the facet better than the flat part of the bell. So you don't need to spend as much time, and if you do spend time, you mess it up. So you spend less time in the facets because there's an equal amount of surface area contact when you spend less time in them. So that's a lot of talking. Hopefully some of that makes sense. It's really important to me because I really like this and I measured yesterday. Esteban came down and I got to play with the Bud Hearse of C, like the, the creme de la creme of C trumpets, like the one, not just like in general, it's like the trumpet that everyone agrees is the best C trumpet in the world. And I got to take that bell and put it on my mandrel because I had my mandrel in two pieces because I can do that. And it fit, not like a glove. If it fit like a glove, that means my mandrel's too big. But it fit in all the right places. It fit back at the tail end of the flare end. And then there was progressively more space between the bell and the mandrel. And there was about 15, 20 thousandths on either side at the most. And that is the amount of spring back that I get when I spin this way. We'll give it a couple action shots of spinning, I think. Hopefully this video is of some substance for some people. So we'll get a wide one and then I get another bell. We can do a, a close up. It's gold brass, but it'll look cool. This is yellow brass. This mandrel is really nice. It's the nicest one I've ever spun on, which is pretty cool. It's chrome plated, so it's very easy to keep clean and it spins so tight because it's matte chrome plated. So the bell really sticks to it. If it's bright polished, it comes off really easy. Get up to a thousand. Hopefully, it's not shaking you too bad. Soap it up before the puddle and after. We take our mini wood stick. This is from Blessing. Just like that, really fast. So, not to put too much work hardening into it. I mean, I'm going to do two passes here. I'm going to do one, go up there, and then pick it up again because I need to get that extra length out. Dive it a little bit to take off that top layer. A little bit of sandpaper, make sure we can get a good bead on there. Yeah, that's a great looking belt. We'll take you in close and we'll show you the facets. That one spun out really nice. That's about as good as you could do. I ended up feeling it in one pass because I just feel it. So you can see it's like an hour. It's really amazing. So here's our. sick of spinning on old kind of messed up mandrels so i will copy the old mandrels make new ones and then keep the old mandrels as archives and not throw them out in the 1990s that for me that makes it all worth it doing like that making bells that freaking nice wow it's like so tight i've got to mark my cut so i make all my bells go to six inches and that's a consistency thing so that gives me a good metric where to start to stop when you play spinning and it helps because then you have good material after you trim because sometimes this would be fine at six inches which i've done before but it's nice to have material to cut off so then you know you're into good trick of material to get a good solid bead that's not going to crack i don't trim all the way through on the leg because i have bell mandrels from old closed factories where they did that and every single one has giant cut marks in the wall. and i understand if you're making one model with one flare diameter that's cool but i make one Four and seven 
donates French beads. No, one's a steel one. But the others are French beads. Ooh, that looks small. I might have cut that too small. That would be really sad. Let's we'll see. Will a French bead and a sea trumpet are just kind of like a match made in heaven? No, I got plenty. It just looks small because the floor is so big. 5.3 is plenty for four and seven eighths. Rule of thumb, you need a half inch, one half inch of material on the diameter for the size bead you need. And you trim back off that half inch, but that gets you there. Wow. So I changed a few things about this process going into this bell. First was the seam roller stuff we talked about in a last video or a video coming out soon. I can't remember what order. Seams coming out are freaking fantastic. Like best seams I've ever made, ever seen on a trumpet, really. And the second thing is I'm drawing with nylon now. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Before, I've been drawing with PETG, which has been great and is a really cost effective way to draw bells well and tubing in general. But the nylon draws harder. It's plastic as well, obviously, so it's the same kind of non-stretching because it does not thin out the metal, but it just draws more precise and it's about twice the price, but I'm switching over to it because with the PETG, the PETG has trouble getting the seam roller lines to lay down. So whenever you roll a bell, there's four little lines that pop up on a bell and they get ironed out pretty routinely throughout the process without even having to do anything to them. Just by burnishing them on a mandrel, you get rid of them. But at the very end, right about here, it's very hard to get rid of them all the way. They're, they're like thousands deep, three or four thousands deep by the end of the process. And I pull a ball through here anyway, so it's not a big deal. So they get burnished out, but it just makes me happy when I draw a bell and they don't exist. Nylon is what I'm switching to. The reason I went with the PETG in the first place, it's about half the price. It's about $1.50 per bell, whereas the nylon's about $3 per bell. But the PETG is reusable. You can boil it and it reforms, which is super sick nasty. But I found that in general, like one in 50, it would just crack just because something in the material or it was acrylic or something, they sent me the wrong shit. But then after reheating about every three out of 10 would explode. And I just got sick of dealing with that. So I just said, screw it. It's a dollar fifty per bell, reasonable. So I can make $3 per bell work. It kind of sucks because I don't make any money, but the product is so much better so much more consistent and it makes me happy. I'm going to spin out this last gold grass one. We'll get a close up shot. These are so, so cool. I'm very excited. Oh good, the gold brass one I have to get is on the bottom. Great. If anyone would like to buy me air conditioning and pay for it every month, heck, I'll buy it. But if someone wants to pay for my air conditioning every month, I will um, make you a trumpet bell for free whenever you want it. Limit one per month. No, that's a bad deal. I'm getting a bad deal. Limit one ever. And you pay for my air conditioning in perpetuity. That means three to five weeks. Don't look at the paperwork. Tighten that bitch down, bad boy. I can't swear anymore. Get that soap flowing. Nice quick pass. Gold grass spins a lot easier too because it's softer. But it's a really good hardness. It's not too soft like red grass. So we're going one pass again. Yeah, that feels good in the neighborhood. Come on. Oh, I'm using the wrong side. I don't go too far into the flare because I found that from talking to some of the musicians that I've been working with, the more thickness you can maintain here, the better they play for orchestral settings, which is kind of interesting. Get a little scribe action. That's it. Wow, that looks so good. Wow. You know, Sometimes it just feels like everything's coming together, you know what I mean? Feels like it's actually all worth it. Maybe. I need to make all my mandrels chrome plated. I've decided. Okay, so Adam has been sanding my bells for like the last six months or so. And he's gonna be a happy camper with these bad boys. Oh yeah. See how shiny it is? Look at that. Mm, very little sanding necessary like here. This is 400 grit. I'm gonna have to cut myself. Wow. Look at that. Just rubbing sandpaper on with my hand. And look at that, that would buff. I'm not gonna buff it because I want to sand the whole thing on a lathe, but that would buff if I wanted to. That's how you make a good bell. And the, the thing that I do that modern manufacturers refuse to understand, no matter how many times I tell them this, is 
because they're all back on the gravy train that the thickness distribution is important because they finally listen after 55 years of people and artists asking them to do thin bells. A thin bell that becomes thin as a result of the process of forming the bell plays different than a thin bell that is mechanically thinned after it's spun. Meaning if you spin a bell that's perfect thickness because of modern manufacturing marvels which are destroying the industry and then you go back and sand the piss out of it, it's not the same. It has to reach its thickness as a part of the bell blank process. And they refuse to understand that and they like their little hydroforming or vacuum forming or whatever, stamping, whatever they want to call it. It's okay. I'm, I'll happily make bells the proper way and watch them suffer. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Hopefully that's enough jammering for the interwebs for this week, Colin. So I need to clean, as you can see. If anyone wants to come clean, I'll buy you two cars. I'll buy you two cars. They might be Hot Wheels, but I'll buy them for you. We'll go to Menard. Do you get whatever candy you want? Oh yeah, let's show you the mandrel up close. So the beautiful thing about this is usually I have to scotch bright all my mandrels, but this paper, just paper towel and you just wipe it and because it's chrome, it just goes away. And as long as you don't sand it or do any scratch to it, it's gonna be like this forever. So you can see facet number one, very small facet. Facet number two, right there. And they're more subtle on the mandrel than they are on the bell because of the spring back. And that's something you have to take into consideration when you're designing a mandrel. It's very cool. Okay, enough talking, bye bye.